The great Bible truth is in the word grace. In fact, it is a concept without which man's salvation would be impossible. Grace is from the Greek word charis. And Joseph Thayer, in his Greek Lexington, English Lexington, wrote this. The New Testament writers used charis preeminently of that kindness by which God bestows favor even upon the ill-deserving and grants to the sinner the pardon of their offenses and bids them to accept eternal salvation through Christ. Now here are some biblical facts regarding God's grace, his kindness towards us. The gospel or the good news is a result of God's grace. Grace is presented as sufficient, and Christians are called by grace. Man is saved and justified by grace. The heart is established by grace. We render acceptable service by grace, and grace imparts endless consolation. As well as God's grace also makes us better people and helps us in our time of need. Now we find the origin of grace listed in several verses. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 7, grace to you and peace from our God and Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is especially associated with Jesus in the New Testament. John 1 verse 17, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. James declares in his book, chapter 1, verse 17, every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. So let us notice some of the recipients of God's grace. Noah found favor or grace in the eyes of the Lord, Genesis 6, verse 8. Of Jesus in Luke chapter 2 verse 40 and the child continued to grow and become strong increasing in wisdom and the grace of God was upon him of the Apostle Paul in 1st Corinthians 15 10 but by the grace of God I am what I am and his grace towards me did not prove vain but I labored even more than all of them yet not I but the grace of God with me. God's grace is universal. It is for all to accept, but only a few receive it. In Ephesians 6 verse 24, grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with a love incorruptible. This certain type of person is obedient, submissive, and trusting to God's requirements and is one who endures faithfully to the end. Now part of the reason as to why it's only a few that have received grace is because others abuse God's grace. In Jude verse 4, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Now this means this is the absence of any restraint to do evil. Just engage in any type of shameful conduct imaginable. One way in which this was done is seen in Romans chapter 6 verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? Paul immediately answers his own question in verse 2. May it never be. Grace among many, even today, continues to be presented in such a fashion as to actually encourage the authorization of sin. Instead of teaching which stresses our responsibility to live godly, we hear statements such as, the way a Christian lives and what he says towards other people has nothing whatsoever to do with the salvation of his soul. This is teaching, once saved, always saved, which is a false doctrine. God's grace is also horribly abused when it's presented by man in such a way that only God is the operative force and agent. Meaning, 
that salvation is a free gift from God to certain individuals that he selects. That our faith and salvation is only dependent upon God without an involvement or a choice on ours is a false doctrine. Now we need next to discuss grace versus merit. The Bible reveals that not only are grace and merit not coexistent, but they are mutually exclusive of each other. In Romans 11, verse 6, But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Salvation cannot simultaneously be by grace and works of merit. If a man could earn his salvation, God's grace would not be necessary. Though the biblical truth is that grace and merit are incap uh, incapable or incompatible, this does not mean that man is submissive, that he does nothing in the matter of enjoying God's grace. The Bible nowhere teaches that man is passive and only God is active in our salvation because God is not wishing for any to perish but for all to come to repentance. For, uh, 2 Peter 3 verse 9 teaches that God has his part there but he wants man to also do something. Now listen closely to Ephesians 2 verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. So grace is God's part active, and faith is man's part active. We have an individual responsibility in order to receive God's grace. In John chapter 6, verse 28 and 29, they said therefore to Jesus, what shall we do? that we may work the works of God. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Our faith, our belief, present tense, is a work according to Jesus. Yet it is not a meritorious work, as Paul was talking about in Ephesians 2, verse 9. Not as a result of works that no man or no one should boast. We cannot do anything to earn our salvation. However, faith is a work of God. Belief or saving faith is always active and obedient. Now an excellent verse regarding God's grace and which also addresses man's role is in Romans 5 verse 21. That as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The expression grace might reign through righteousness reveals the environment in which grace is successful. Righteousness is God's commandments and man's humble submission to all that God requires of man. In Acts 10, verse 34 and 35, and opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Fear him and does what is right is obedient faith. And what we have just observed is God and man in the matter of grace. Man's sins cancel out God's grace. Grace can be received in vain. We can be removed from grace. Grace can be nullified by man and Christians can fall from grace. We are to stand in grace. We are to grow in grace and we are to be strong in grace. Now God has revealed in the New Testament as the divine pattern 
for man's salvation as believing, repenting, and water baptism. A popular objection in the religious community to the necessity of baptism involves salvation and works. People in the denominations often say baptism is a work and we are not or cannot be saved by works. Now that statement is true and that statement is false. But it depends upon if you understand the Bible's teaching on these subjects. Certainly water baptism is a thing done or it is an action committed and as such it is a work. But is it a work of merit in which one earns salvation or is it a work of faith in which one receives salvation. In considering the work involved in baptism, who is truly the one at work? Is it the sinner, the male or the female who submits to being immersed? Or is it God who forgives and regenerates, renews, restores, revives through the blood of Jesus and the working of the Holy Spirit? As one's mind is clearly open to consider what the Bible teaches, there is no contradiction between the idea that we are saved by faith and not works of merit, and at the same time saved when submitting to water baptism. Now listen carefully. Baptism is a work of faith, not merit. Now, there are different kinds of works found in the Bible. There are works of merit. These are works that are done to earn something. Those who have done such works believe that they deserve something. They believe they will be saved because they kept the Ten Commandments or they went to church services and did good deeds. But it is these kind of works that Paul has under consideration in Romans chapter 3, verse 27, 28, Ephesians 2, verse 8, 9, and Titus 3, verse 4 and 5. There is no way we can earn or merit salvation. All the good that we might do cannot outweigh even one sin. The Bible is clear as Paul writes that one cannot do works of merit to earn salvation. However, there are also works of faith. These are things done to receive something. Those having done such works believe they deserve nothing. They understand that their obedience did not earn or merit their salvation. They understand their salvation rests completely upon God's grace and mercy, not because God is obligated to them. Such works can rightly be called the works of God. Now we have already noticed faith itself is called a work by Jesus back in John chapter 6, verse 28 and 29. Another work of faith commanded by God is repentance. God is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent. Acts 20 verse 30. That means to change your lifestyle, to give up practicing sin. Though such works as faith and repentance are commanded, they are not meritorious works. We do not earn salvation through them. They are works God has ordained. We do to receive his salvation. Now please understand, when all is said and done, salvation is still by God's grace and mercy. Now what is said of faith and repentance is also said of water baptism. Did you know that? 
Again, listen carefully. Baptism is a work of faith, not merit. Baptism requires faith. It comes after believing. The necessity of faith was emphasized by Jesus. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. But he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Mark 16, verse 16. Philip, to the eunuch, made belief a prerequisite to baptism in Acts chapter 8, verse 35. And Philip opened his mouth. And beginning from this scripture, which happens to be Isaiah 53, he preached Jesus to him. The eunuch now believes in Jesus as is seen in verse 36. And as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look water. What prevents me from being baptized? The denominational world fails to understand that it was the eunuch that mentioned baptism when seeing the water. Therefore, in the preaching of Jesus to the eunuch, Philip must have taught baptism also as a command. Baptism is an act of faith by which one receives, not earns, the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2, verse 38, And Peter said to them, Repent. And let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We receive union with Christ in his death. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Galatians 3, verse 27. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. That baptism is not a work of merit is emphasized in Titus chapter 3, verse 5. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of or by the Holy Spirit. While God saves us through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, which is an illusion to an illusion to water baptism, God does not save us by deeds which we have done in righteousness or works of merit. Baptism is clearly seen as not some work of righteousness done to earn salvation. Nowhere. Does the Bible suggest that baptism is a work of merit by which God owes us salvation upon the basis of our baptism? Like belief and repentance, water baptism is simply an act of faith by which we receive salvation. And what or why is that so? Because baptism involves the working of God. God is at work in baptism. Colossians 2 verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. It is God who does the work, not man. In Colossians 2 verse 13. He made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. Man is dead in his sins, but God makes him alive, forgiving him of sins when buried with Jesus at baptism. So it is God who saves us, not ourselves which God does through the washing of regeneration, baptism, and the renewing by the Holy Spirit or the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now think of baptism as a spiritual operation, an operation in which God, the great physician, does his work. When one needs a physical operation, it requires faith in the skills of the doctor to submit to the operating table 
when the surgery is over, have I earned or merited my healing? No. It required both faith or trust in the surgeon and a willingness to obey or submit to him. In other words, trust and obey. So my faith in Jesus dying for my sins prompted me to submit to the spiritual operation of water baptism in which God did his wonderful work of cleansing by the blood of Jesus and then sealed me with the Holy Spirit. Now when we understand that baptism is a work of faith, not a work of merit, and it is a working of God at which time we receive salvation, not earn salvation, when we comprehend that simple Bible fact, we do not reject the necessity of baptism under the mistaken idea that it's a work where we try to earn salvation. Sadly, many people, they reject baptism because they only see it as something to do. In reality, baptism is the most passive act of faith requiring to receive Christ as well as the blessings he provides. Belief and repent are things that we do. On the other hand, baptism is something done to us. Think about it. Faith and repentance are both active acts of faith on our part, where baptism is also an act of faith on our part, but it is a humble act of faith in which we are submitting to the working of God in our lives. Now, to deny baptism because it requires man to do something should or would also require one to object to faith and repentance, for they also require man to do something. The denominational world is not consistent in their reasoning. Let us now spend the remainder of our time noticing the act of baptism as an essential part or role in and of the New Testament church. Shortly before Jesus ascended to heaven, he gave his apostles what we commonly refer to as the Great Commission, recorded in Matthew 28, verse 28 and 29. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Then in Mark 16, verse 15 and 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Then in Luke 24, verse 47, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. Now in these three recorded places on the Great Commission, belief, repentance, and baptism is mentioned. In fact, if you notice, baptism was stated twice in the three Gospels. In Matthew's account, it is related to the process of making disciples. In Mark's statement, it is mentioned in connection with salvation. Whatever the purpose of baptism, it must be important to Jesus because he commanded it to be done by us. Now since it was commanded by Christ, God in the flesh, it is certainly worthy of careful consideration. It is my intention to gather from the Bible only that which it actually teaches on this subject. And I hope that you have the attitude of those in Berea. For they received the word with great eagerness examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Acts 17, verse 11. 
To embrace the New Testament with great enthusiasm is to listen carefully with the desire to understand the truth. And if you at first do not agree with what I am teaching, then examine the scriptures more closely to make sure what I'm saying is true is in harmony with the Bible. Be like the Christians in the town of Berea. Let us next notice how the apostles carried out the great commission that Jesus gave to them to see what they said about water immersion, baptism in their preaching. Notice baptism in the preaching of Peter. On the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, is the first gospel sermon delivered by Peter. Now notice that Peter told his Jewish people, his audience, in verse 36, believe or know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now a lot of folks think that these Jews who murdered Jesus were saved right then and there. No. Because they asked in verse 37, what shall we do? And Peter tells them in verse 38 how to make it right. Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. One is not saved before having his sins forgiven or removed. Now, as a result of his sermon in verse 40, notice verse 41. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Now, if you were paying attention, you will notice that Peter followed Jesus' great commission precisely. Verse 36, believe. Verse 38, repent and be baptized. Peter preached the gospel and commanded people to be baptized. The purpose they were commanded to be baptized was for, in order to have their sins forgiven. Now in Acts 10, we find Peter, this time, preaching the gospel not to Jews, but to a Gentile family. God desires the Gentiles to be saved too. In verse 48, and he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So we have one of the original 12 apostles named Peter obeying the Great Commission by practicing water baptism. Did anyone else in the New Testament church do the same? Well, in Acts chapter 6, verse 5, we come across a Christian by the name of Philip who is called the evangelist in Acts 21, verse 8. So in Acts chapter 8, verse 5, we find, And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. Now notice their response in verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Now still in Acts chapter 8, you have the evangelist now sitting in a chariot with the Ethiopian eunuch. In verse 35, And Philip opened in his mouth, and beginning from the scripture, he preached Jesus to him. As mentioned earlier, the eunuch was ready to be baptized after believing in Jesus. Verse 38, And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. Only immersion requires that both go down into the water. Like Peter, Philip preached Jesus not only by telling people about Jesus, but also what Jesus commanded. Water baptism was an immediate result of such preaching by Peter the apostle as well as Philip the evangelist. Well, let's examine another individual that preached baptism, the Apostle Paul. In the conversion of a woman named Lydia, you will note again that baptism followed apostolic preaching. In Acts 16, verse 13, Paul is speaking to some women by a riverside. 
Verse 14. And a certain woman named Lydia was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. He is preaching. And her heart is pricked through Paul's spoken word. Her conscience is laid bare to receive the New Testament message of salvation, which is what it means when it says the Lord opened her heart. Still in chapter 16, look at verse 15. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Well, how could Paul have judged her to be faithful to the Lord? By her positive response to the command of the Lord through Paul's preaching concerning water baptism. In the same chapter 16, you find the conversion of the Philippians jailer. In verse 30 and 31, you've got Paul and Silas. They tell the jailer that he must believe on the Lord to be saved. Yet, the jailer was not as of yet saved as some teach. Because Paul had to explain to the jailer who Jesus was in talking about the word of the Lord to them in verse 32. Now, in response to Paul's very late time of preaching, sometime way after midnight, verse 25, the jailer, in verse 33, took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. That's his repentance. And immediately was baptized, he and all his household. Evidently, the word of the Lord stressed the need to be baptized quickly. You don't wait days or weeks. In fact, and every detailed example of the conversions in the book of Acts, people were baptized only after one lesson, then and there. Now why is that? What did they see in baptism then that the denominations today are missing? In Acts 18, Paul is now preaching in Corinth. Verse 8, and many of the Corinthians when they heard, were believing and being baptized. When hearing, they did not schedule baptism for tomorrow. Well, what about Paul's own conversion, which is recorded in Acts 9, chapter 22, as well as chapter 26? Paul recounts his change from Old Testament Judaism to New Testament Christianity. He describes how he was told by Jesus to go into the city of Damascus and it shall be told you what you must do, chapter 9, verse 6. One of the things he was told to do was to be immersed in water without waiting. And now why do you delay? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on his name, Acts 22. Verse 16. He was told to be baptized in order to wash away his sins. Now think about this. In spite of the fact that Paul saw the resurrected Jesus in person on the road to Damascus, he was still lost. Seeing Jesus and accepting him as Lord did not save Paul. He had to do more. In spite of the fact that he spent three days in fasting and prayer, he was still lost. Paul's repentance did not save him. He still had to do more. Why? Because he was still in his sins. Not until he was baptized were his sins washed away forgiven. Please understand, we are not saved by works, but by grace. And water baptism is a work, but not a work of merit to be saved, but a work of faith to contact God's grace in which we are saved by Jesus' blood only. 
Let us suppose that I was to offer one of you a hundred dollar bill. I said, if you desire to have it, you just come up here now and take it. You would understand that that was a free gift. No strings attached. You didn't have to do anything to earn it. And yet, you did perform a work. You left your chair. You walked up here and you extended your hand to receive the money from me is viewed as a work. Not of merit, but a work of faith. You trusted in what I said would be true. So you did something. You obeyed my simple command in order to receive what you did not merit. Now if you can comprehend my illustration. Why is it so difficult in accepting baptism as a work of faith? Why not this morning come and receive, take hold of a free gift far worth more than a hundred dollar bill? Though your sins are as scarlet, they can be as white as snow this morning. Though they are red like crimson, they can be like wool this morning. Having believed and repented, come and receive salvation in contacting the blood of Christ at water baptism for the washing away of your sins. If you're subject to his call and if you need to respond, do it right now as together we stand. And as